Okay, in this video I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on electrostatics. This is video number 9 and I'm going to discuss Gauss's Law for Electric Fields. I'd like to draw your attention to my website, universityphysicstories.com and if you'd like to find out about updates on what I'm posting or find out news in general about what I'm posting, you can follow me on Twitter at AdamBT503. So, for this video there are quite a few others which are relevant and they're from di different sections of my tutorial series. Uh, so, the videos we'll say from this series on electrostatics are number 8 where I discuss electric field lines and numbers 3a through 7 where I discuss calculating the electric field. Now in videos 3a to 7 I calculated the electric field for a lot of different circumstances or scenarios and we found that in general it was a pain in the face and the reason it was a pain in the face is because the electric field is a vector. So what we're going to see in this particular video is that Gauss's law simplifies the process of calculating the electric field under a particular circumstance, in other words, when there is symmetry. And in the case that you do not have symmetry or a specific type of symmetry, you revert back to the cases in 3a through 7 where we have a pain in the face calculating the electric field. In my videos on vector calculus for electromagnetism, number 2 I discussed the daughter scalar product and number eight I discussed how to calculate the normal vector. So they, they are important. They're, I suppose they're additional pieces of information that are rather being particularly important. But the video at number 43 on my tutorial series on quantum statistics, spherical polar coordinates, is very important and I'll be using that in this video. So just to show you what, what specifically I'll be using in this video, I'll be using video number eight, I'll be using video number two from Vector Calculus for Electromagnetism, and video 43 from, spherical, uh, 43 from vector calculus on spherical polar coordinates. Now, as you probably see looking at the, we'll say the, the time here, it's um, a reasonably long video. And Gauss's law on the face of it can be a very straightforward thing. But I think there's actually a lot more going on that what, than what a lot of people kind of pretend is going on. So if you want a thorough understanding, I think it's worthwhile watching the things that I'm going to show you in this video. And not just showing you, for example, the answer which we'll see in a moment, is that the closed surface integral of e dot dA is equal to uh, Q over epsilon zero. Okay, that's, that's the answer, and I can give you that straight out and we'll be all happy, up until we start having problems when we try and actually calculate things. So, a small bit of a revision. We saw in video number eight that if we have a positive, t a positive source charge of, let's say, positive Q, the electric field lines begin on a positive charge and their direction is away from it because the electric field lines show you the direction of the electric field. The electric field is a vector, so of course it has to have uh, it has to have field lines, or excuse me, it has to have a direction. So, right now, you might sometimes hear me say that the the field is being emitted from the charge, or you know, or whatever. It's it's radiating. Okay, so R A D I A T I N G or whatever. If I say those, it's a slip of the tongue. And the reason is as follows. You can think of the electric field as a mathematical construct, or you can think of it as an actual physical entity. For example, if you think of a pond, and you drop a stone into the pond like that, you're going to get these ripples or these waves extending outwards. So you can consider, for example, that the field is in actual fact the, 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 the pond, and it's through the medium of the pond, or the, uh, the, the field that we're able to transfer our... Uh, information. But I'm not trying to think about the electric field in that way. If you want to know more, just watch my video on scientific scientific models. Okay, I think that, that should help. But look, if you already accept the point, well, then it's moot, I suppose. So the field then of a negative charge or negative test charge, say that's, um, okay, that means negative Q, we'll say, right? Negative test charge. But the the electric field lines terminate on a negative charge like that. Now, what's important is that we draw a representative number or proportional number of field lines for the charge. So if I draw four field lines for a charge of magnitude Q, well then if I, if I have the charge of magn magnitude 2Q, I must double the, number of, uh, double the number of lines. Okay? So for that reason, although I can draw an infinite number of field lines, because I'm doing it proportional to the number of charges or the magnitude of the charge, then the, field, the number of field lines will always be an indication or proportional to your charge. Okay? Or you, could, you might say the, the field lines through an area or through a surface 
uh, or we'll say the field line density is also a, a, an indication and that's because we draw a proportional number. Now I'd like to draw your attention to, to something um, interesting in uh, uh, we'll say for electric charges. Let's say we have two charges, namely char uh, we'll say two sets of charges, right? So we have one positive charge and one negative charge. All right. So the sum of the charges in this case is going to be equal to zero, of course. So what if I then take 100 charges and we put them in a box, of course? You know, we're putting them together, and we're looking at kind of the, the net. There's a vehicle moving outside there. I'm sorry about that. So if 100, ne say negative 100 uh, Q here. Now what's the total charge here? It's zero again. So think about it. How many charges are in, let's say, box? The first box. Well, there are two charges. But although there are two charges, we may as well have no charges because the net result is zero. Similarly, there are 200 here, but the net result is zero. So it seems like that sometimes we can sum the charges, and by the way, that gives us we call that capital Q. Uh, we sum the charges, and it, it seems that they kind of sum to zero. Their net effect of all the charges is that they're zero, even though, of course, they are there. So in video number eight, we discussed the field of a dipole. And a dipole is the electric field made by two two equal but opposite charges, right? Q and minus Q. The field starts on a positive charge and terminates on a negative charge, okay? So let's draw some of the field lines, right? Now, I'm gonna draw those ones in that color and let's draw some other ones going, we'll say, like this. That one's going off into infinity. Okay, so just bear with me a moment while I, while I set this up, so. I'm sure you, if you follow my videos, you know at this stage it's not the greatest at, at drawing. My art isn't the best. Now, let's say, for example, I put these two charges Q in a box. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of the, the just that because we can assume we know where we know where they are at this stage. But let's say the box is just big enough so that it takes in the charges and the field lines I've drawn in green. Right now, if you think about the build-up of the field, now the build, excuse me, the build up of the field, uh, of, the f of, of, of E field, right? Just, you know, I'm going to use this term loosely for the moment. Think about the build up. Well, there is no build up of the field inside because it's starting, it's, we'll say, being emitted on this positive charge, but it's also terminating on the negative charge. So there is no build up as a result of the green, uh, the green field lines. So any test charges inside, we'll say, um, will contribute nothing to the build up of the field. Of course, that's in the case where the sum of the charges is equal to zero, or we have no net charge. Now, if you look at the field lines on the, excuse me, I've drawn the wrong, I've, I've drawn the wrong uh, arrow here. Okay, these, of course, that is that's a very rookie mistake. They should look like this for the negative charge. But if we look at the remaining field lines that I've drawn, we have on the right hand side we'll say three lines coming in, but their corresponding lines on the, on the other side are three lines going out. So the build-up of the field inside the box will be zero because the same number of lines are flowing in as are flowing out. So in the case where we have no net charge or the sum of the charges is zero, we have equal, a number of, the equal number of opposite charges, then we get no build-up of, no build of the field. Of course, then if we have, let's say, for example, we had a positive 2Q, and one we had negative Q, there would be a build-up of, of, of the field because there would be more, um, more of the field associated with the positive charge. So I think that's enough of our um, of, of revision. It's time to look at a thing which I'm going to call the flux. The flux, okay? Now, let's say for, for the moment we're going to call the flux means the flow. And you might say, why, would we, why won't we just use the word flow? Well, we're talking about the flux of the electric field, all right? So why don't you say the flow of the electric field? The answer is, I, I don't actually know the answer to that, but I suggest it's because if we're talking about flow, let's say we're talking about, um, uh, let's say we're talking about fluid dynamics. So you're an engineer, for example, uh, well, not necessarily an engineer, but um, you might be an engineer discussing fluid dynamics, okay? So, but you're talking about a particular fluid, whether it be water, oil, or whatever it is, so you, you know your medium. So perhaps that's why we use the word flow. But we're talking about, when we're talking about a flux, we're talking about the flux of the electric field, which, as I said a moment ago, is and is not a real thing. It's perhaps a mathematical construct or whatever it is, okay, depending on your model. 
So we're going to use the word flow for the electric and magnetic fields. Okay, so the flow of the fields. Now, what does flow mean? Let's say we have, here, here is my, um, uh, okay, the whiteboard which you were looking at, let's say, I want to calculate the flow of the electric field through the whiteboard, right? Due to a charge which is, as you look, underneath my whiteboard, and I want to measure it where you, the, you the, the viewer is. So let's define my y-axis here my and my x-axis here. So if my source charge, which is underneath my whiteboard, as you look, has a component, um, if my field, excuse me, then has a component in, say, the x-direction, it is going to be parallel to the xy plane or parallel to the area which I want to calculate the flow through. So of course none of it is going to be flowing, none of the x component is flowing through the board. Similarly none of the y component is flow, flowing through the board. What is flowing through the board is our z component. Alright? So in this case let's define uh, the, towards the u the viewer as positive z. So only the positive z components of the electric field will flow. But what is that? What uh, what particular uh, part or component of the field is that? It's the field perpendicular to your to through your surface. So let's say, for example, we have an arbitrary surface. I'm going to give it a rectangle with my poor drawing. Okay, and for some reason we have we have this we have the electric field going parallel through it. All right. To say for a moment that the field lines are parallel. Okay. Now. How do we calculate the flow of this case, if the flow of it in this case? Well, we need to talk about a dot product. Because remember, the dot product, uh, it picks out the component of dA, which is, we'll say, this is, this is our surface area. So dA, that's dA. It picks out the component of dA, uh, um, we'll say, along the direction of the electric field. It sees how much of the, we'll say, dA is along the electric field. Another way of looking at it, but we won't actually use, is to think about the normal vector. If, we'll say here, say this is, this is my, um, say that is my surface, and my field is flowing through it like this. Well, the normal vector is going, to be, oh, is going to be normal like that. So if my normal vector is parallel to my electric field, then there is going to be a, a maximum flow or flux through the, uh, th through, the, um, through the surface. So how we look at that is we'd wonder we'd say how you know we want to work out their dot product so we could take the dot product of the field with the normal vector but the, the better way to do is to take the dot product of the field with the infinitesimal area element okay so let's say for example then I suddenly had a bigger area I'd have to integrate this to get the flux and because it's a surface we're integrating it over the surface okay so integrating the flux or the flow of e dot dA across the surface and that calculates the flux through our surface now, so we're going to give the Greek letter capital Phi as flux. We're going to give it the subscript E to say it's the flux of the electric field. And we're going to say it's the, the, the surface integral of E dot dA. E dot dA. All right? So that's the, the flux of the electric field. So why, what, what can we do with this? Well, think about this now, right? So the flux is, it's a measure of the number of field lines passing through the surface S. So I'll just draw my surface S once more. So the flux is a measure of the number of field lines passing. And I'm going to discuss that more in a moment. So say the field is this. Okay, I might, I might, do, I might do something like this. Okay, I might do something like this. But the reason is, is because we can only well we can only draw a sample number of field lines as I said at the, earlier on okay the total number of field lines would be infinite as I said in the I said in the past but for a given sampling rate the flux is proportional to the number of lines drawn and this is because the field strength is proportional to the density of field lines which in this case is the number of field lines per unit area so e dot da which is here e dot da Okay, is proportional to the number of lines passing through the infinitesimal area element dA. All right, like I said earlier, the dot product picks out the component of dA along the electric field. Okay, now we're only talking about the plane perpendicular to E. Uh, that's the, thing, the only thing you have in mind when we talk about the density of field lines per unit area. So where do we go from here? Okay, we go from here by thinking about our electric dipole. We said when the sum of, we we'll say the sum of the charges in the Q sub i in some sort of a box was equal to zero, then the number of 
field lines flowing in if we just draw three of them is equal to the number of field lines flowing out. Okay, so that was kind of a special case which we could uh, imply from video number eight. But what this here suggests, we'll say that the flux e dot dA, it suggests that the flux through any closed surface, so that means we have to close it here, right? The flux through any closed surface is a measure of the total charge inside. And you might say, well, wh wh why, why is that? It's because the fields, field lines that, if the field line, or uh, it will say, look at, look at the positive charge, the field lines must, will say, they must begin at a positive charge. So, right? So that means they must either begin at the positive charge, and it will say, either pass through your surface if they're inside it, or they must terminate on a negative charge. Okay? But, uh, on the other hand, a charge outside a surface will contribute nothing to the total flux. And you might say, why does a charge outside contribute nothing to the total flux? If this is my surface, and I want to calculate the flux due to this charge here, well, anything, the, any uh, field lines that go in will come straight back out at some other point. So the net build-up of the field, if you want to think about it that way, is going to be zero if the charge is outside. All right? But as I said earlier on, if you have a single charge inside, now let's say the net charge is not zero, you have a single charge inside of plus Q. Its field lines must either go out, okay, must go out, or they must terminate on a negative charge inside. Okay, they must terminate on a negative charge inside. So this is the essence of Gauss's law. All right, so what do we do next? So we're, now, by the way, the flux, I probably shouldn't have put that, um, probably shouldn't have put the closed integral on. That's the flux, but we're saying that the flux across a closed surface uh, uh, of e dot dA, or the flux across a closed surface, is a measure of the charge inside. So to illustrate this, let's think of the simplest possible scenario. Let's think of a point charge. Okay, there's my point charge, positive Q, and it's emitting, it's emitting the, uh, emitting, it is the source of the electric field like this. It is emitting isotropically, if you want to think, iso, T, O, P, I, C, A, L, O, Y, or it is an isotropic uh, source because it's emitting, that means it's invariant with respect to direction. So in every direction it is the same. So think about it earlier on, right? We, we, if it, because it's invariant with respect to direction, the field is, it's always good to think about a sphere. So we think about, well, what is the, the what's E dot dA, the flux, due to this source charge on the, the, on, on the sphere, okay? So this, let's say the surface of a sphere somewhere, okay? And we give the surface, uh, we give the sphere an arbitrary radius, and I know my drawing is terrible, it looks, doesn't look like a sphere. Perhaps if I put it here, it might. Okay, so there, and we have plus Q. So we're trying to measure the, uh, the flux through that particular surface. But we know what the, fl what we know what the electric field of a point charge is, it's very simple. It's going to be, we'll say, 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, which I call k. It's going to be q over r squared, r hat. So it's radial, all right? So we want to do e dot dA across this and calculate the total flux on the surface, this arbitrary surface. We're picking a sphere because it's, it, it's, it's, the, it's the most uh, obvious because we're, we'll say the field is going down with r squared. And let's calculate the flux. Okay, so dA is, if you look in the video on spherical polar coordinates, dA was r squared, or is r squared, sine theta, d phi, d theta, r hat. Okay, that's dA. So the flux then is going to be the following. We're going to get, and we're going to do the closed integral, okay, so because, like I said, the closed integral should be the measure of the, the charge inside. The closed integral of e dot dA is going to be k, which is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. Okay, we're going to have the integral of q over r, uh, q over r squared r hat dot with uh, dotted with r squared sine theta d phi d theta r hat. Of course, the dot product is going to pick out the uh, the, par the parallel components. So we'll say we can get rid of the uh, the r r's like that. Okay, so we're doing this integral. Now, what are the limits? Spherical polar coordinates. We integrate theta we'll say here from 0 to pi, okay, and we integrate phi from 0 to 2 pi, 0 to 2 pi. So we can see that the, oh, I've actually, uh, uh, that's 
that's phi there, okay? So this d phi, this d phi here, excuse me, is only going to contribute 2 pi when you integrate it. So the integral then is 2 pi times the, uh, so you have 2 pi times the integral with respect to d theta. Okay, that's the integral we must do. Okay, integrating it from 0 to pi. Okay, I hope you understand that. If you don't, look at my video on spherical polar coordinates. It's pretty straightforward. Okay, now the interesting part here is as follows. Just to rewrite it, we had, we say we had q, we had, um, we had q, we had 1 over r squared, we had an r squared, we had sine of theta, and we had d theta. That's what we had to integrate, multiply by this k times 2 pi. But the interesting point here is as follows. Coulomb's law goes down with 1 over r squared, okay? So it, it's um, inversely proportional to the square of the distance. But the, so we'll say that's the, the field is going down with, uh, with the square of the, uh, the distance that you are from your, from your point source. But the area, we'll say, at, of, we'll say our sphere that we're trying to calculate the surface area, the flux through the surface area, is growing with r squared. So the point is the two of these cancel. So the electric field is going down with r squared, but the area, we can say, we can make the area of the surface, or area of the sphere bigger and bigger and bigger. So the point is that the, their corresponding r squareds cancel. And that is absolutely crucial, because what that means is that although we chose a, a sphere where, with which to integrate, it turns out that the answer is invariant with respect to your surface. Okay? So the, the, that's the whole point of Gauss's law. The answer is invariant with respect to your surface. So if we do the integral, we're going to get the following. Uh, just, you can do the integral yourself. It's pretty straightforward. You're just going to get q over epsilon 0. So to rewrite it, the flux through a spherical surface uh, due to a single point charge at the origin, the close, close e dot dA was equal to q over epsilon 0, where q is the charge. But we said, of course, it's invariant with respect to the surface. Although we chose a surface of a sphere, it doesn't necessarily, didn't necessarily have to be a sphere. And this is Gauss's law. And I'm going to build it up to be more general in a moment, okay? So we'll make some, we'll make some comments on that now as we go along, right? So the same amount of field lines pass through any sphere centered at the origin regardless of the size. Of course, that should make sense. So we don't, it doesn't have to be a sphere, it can be any surface, whatever the shape, and it will still trap the same number of field lines. So the flux through any surface enclosing the charge is Q over epsilon zero, and that's Gauss's law. So the closed surface integral of E dot dA is equal to the charge enclosed over epsilon zero. But we know that the electric field obeys the superposition principle. So E total would be E1 plus E2, or it would be the sum over of E sub n, n like that. Okay, I'm sure that. I'm sure that makes sense to you. So that means, in order, if we had, we'll say, num a number of charges, let's say we put, I don't know, a number of charges like this, and I said we can take any surface, but I'm just going to take a spherical surface again. Well then, if we were to calculate the flux this time, it would just be the sum of all the individual fluxes. Okay, so let's do that. So we're going to get the closed surface integral of E dot dA is equal to the sum of i is equal to 1 to n, we'll say there are n charges, we're going to have the integral of e sub i dot dA, the closed integral, okay, and that's going to be equal to the sum i is equal to 1 to n of q sub i over epsilon 0, but what's that? Simply capital Q over epsilon 0, where we define capital Q to be the total charge enclosed. So the point here is this, that where we have a number of charges, we can generalize Gauss's law to the sum, or excuse me, the closed surface integral of e dot dA is equal to the total charge enclosed divided by epsilon zero. And it's invariant with respect to the surface chosen. That's the important part. And this is Gauss's law for electric fields. This is Gauss's law. Now, the interesting thing here, the important point to note is that Gauss's law holds for every surface but it's not always useful because you can't always get symmetry. So Gauss's law really only works when we have symmetry. It really only works when we have symmetry. And the three forms of symmetry we, we usually use are spherical, 
cylindrical, planar, or cubic. Okay, and we'll be talking about all of these later on. Okay, so of course we're going to have a different area element for each of these. Well, DL will be you'll have well DA you will actually still have DA, um, excuse me, and then cubic you'll have a DA as well. So all, but they all have a different infinitesimal area element. Okay, so is there anything else I want to say? There is. So just to reiterate, notice that the one over r squared character of Coulomb's law. Uh, was crucial because without it the cancellation with the r squared above the line wouldn't have happened and the total flux um, would depend on the surface chosen and not merely on the total charge enclosed whereas in this case it only depends on the total charge enclosed so we call this Gauss's law in integral form so so far what we have is Gauss's law in integral form okay so it's the closed surface integral of e dot dA is q enclosed over epsilon zero However, it's often, it's often of more use to write it in the di differential form. So if you look at my videos on electromagnetism for, uh, sorry, excuse me, vector calculus for electromagnetism, you'll find the divergence theorem. And this is it here. I'm not going to go into it, okay, at the moment, because I've already done that in the past. So if we apply it to uh, what we have as, as Gauss's law, if you look at E dot dA, the closed surface integral of E dot dA. So we here we have closed sur surface integral of V dot dA. So we can rewrite that as the, the volume integral of the divergence of our vector. So it's going to be the volume integral of the divergence of the electric field, integrated d tau, because it's a volume integral, of course, and that's still equal to q enclosed over epsilon zero. Now the trick here is to rewrite the charge enclosed. So it's one over epsilon zero, but it's going to be the volume integral of the charge density d tau. Okay? Now, because the uh, this we'll say the integrals have to be equal, and if you just think about it, that is the case. We get that the divergence of E is equal to rho over epsilon zero, and we call this Gauss's law in differential form. We call this up here Gauss's law in integral form. So you might say to yourself, well, why do you use that? Well, well bo both of them, I suppose, uh, they have the same information, right? Gauss's law in differential form, Gauss's law in integral form. The differential version is tidier, but the integral form has the advantage in that it accommodates point, line, and surface charges more naturally. So that's all I've got to say about that. Thanks for watching. I know it was quite a long video. Uh, please pass it on to your friends, subscribe to my channel, and you might visit universityphysicstutorials.com.